Good morning. It's uh, very nice to be here. I always like coming to America because you've got such cute accents. <laughs> I, was, uh, <laughs> I, I was talking at a conference in uh, uh, Melbourne a few years ago, and uh, there was a, it was a conference on disability, and there was a woman right down in the front in a wheelchair, and all the way through my talk, she was um, sleeping. And I, I said to her afterwards, uh, you were sleeping during my talk. And she said, no, I wasn't. She says, I, I had to close my eyes because I, I couldn't get used to the, the dissonance between your voice and your face. <laughs> so if you're experiencing dissonance between my voice and my face, then this is the time to get over it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's funny. Um, that was a great presentation, Stephanie. I, I really, you know, it just opens up all of the issues, and it's really personal, but it's really deep, so thank you for that. Um, I just want to kind of build on, on some of the things that Stephanie uh, brought to our attention. Um, and I want us to focus on something a little bit unusual, perhaps, and that's our bodies. There's a, a really interesting ethicist called Stephen Post, who... Um, talks about Western culture as being hypercognitive. Now, by that he means that we place uh, uh, too much value on cognition and intellect over community, love, relationships. As a, a culture, we value people's intelligence. Uh, we value their cognitive ability and their verbal, uh, ability to verbally articulate themselves which makes it very difficult for people to have uh, dementia or to have profound intellectual disabilities or to have the confusion of mental illness. If we're hypercognitive, then we sometimes begin to associate the things that we know, the things that we experience with what it means to be a human being. So I want us today just to think about our bodies and the significance of our bodies for the way that we understand one another, for the way that we understand God, and ultimately, for the way that we understand uh, disability. So if I could have my first slide up there, that'd be great. Um, and the place I want to begin is with uh, the soulfulness of the human body. One of the things about disability is that, and one of the things that Stephanie highlighted really well was the awkwardness and the fear of difference. When different bodies come together, there's a dissonance. There's a, a kind of uncomfortableness. Uh, and the question is, how do we understand that? And how do we overcome that? And I think the place to begin to understand something of that dis dissonance and to overcome that dissonance is to think about what Scripture tells us about the body, what it means to be embodied in that sense. And the way, I want us just to... Uh, begin with Genesis. Uh, uh, I begin to think here. In Genesis 2-7, uh, there's a fascinating passage. The reason I'm looking at this is because I haven't got my glasses and I can't see that, so bear with me. Later. So I'll be up and down a little bit. So the writer of Genesis is get this fantastic big picture of the creation. And then God creates human beings. He says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So you get that sense of inspiration that God breathes his nephesh, his spirit, into human beings, and out of dust comes human beings, comes life in that sense. St. Augustine describes it as human beings as terra animata, animated dust. It's a beautiful thing that God creates us and sustains us, and it's only his spirit that makes it the difference between us being dust and being animated life in that sense. So every breath that we take is a breath that's given to us by God. In that sense, we're embodied by and held together by the breath of God. So human beings are seen to be created from uh, matter, but inspired, given breath, brought into living existence by the very breath of God. And this is the important thing. We are our bodies as we are our souls. It's only because God sustains us that we have, have any sense of life. And that's why, you know, when you look, 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 read through the Psalms of Lament, 
The psalmist is always worried about God withdrawing his nephesh because if God withdraws his nephesh, then there is absolutely nothing, nothing at all. So he's terrified of that, and that's why, one of the reasons why he tends to lament. So, as earth animated by the breath of God, human beings are seen to be holy creatures living among other holy creatures in a world that is holy, as Wendell Berry puts it. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Holy creatures living among other holy creatures in a, a world that is holy. So in that sense, everybody is holy. Now, I don't mean that holiness comes from human beings. I mean that God indwells us. God inspires us. And it's the holiness of God that we reflect in our bodies that are inspired by the very breath of God. So in that sense, attending to God's creatures is a mode of attending to God. As we engage with one another, it's almost like a mode of worship. Now, I don't mean by that that we, we kind of look beyond ourselves to where God is. I simply mean that God is in the midst of the human body and human bodily encounters, and God brings holiness into the way that we come together. Now, there's something really beautiful about that. What would it be like if we could really look at one another and see that? and see the holiness of God within one another, and see each of our encounters as a holy encounter, as a worshipful encounter. What would it be like if we were able to engage with Adam and see that as a holy encounter, and see his body as inspired, as filled with God's nephesh, as sustained by God in his very being, and as we engage with him, so we worship in that sense. My point is that the differences in our bodies are important. They reveal different parts of who we are. They reveal different aspects of who God is. They reveal different ways in which we can come together to become the body of Christ in that sense. So Paul puts it this way. He said, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Now, what I'm suggesting to you is that we put to one side for the moment the idea that we have disability ministries as if people with disabilities were something different, other kinds of creatures that we need to look after in that sense, and begin to take seriously Paul's suggestion, statement, factual statement, that it's as our different bodies come together that the body of Christ finds its fullness. So disabled bodies, whatever that might look like, I mean, if we look around here, whose body represents normality, apart from my own, of course. <clears throat> that as our different bodies come together, we begin to recognize and understand the richness and the deepness of the body of Christ, but also we begin to encounter hidden dimensions of who God is and what it means to be a creature sustained by the breath of God and at the same time being made in the image of that very God. John Hull, a British um, practical theologian, began to go blind in his early 50s. And in uh, his book, uh, Touching the Rock, and in a number of really interesting papers that he wrote around that, he describes his experience of going blind. Uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic kind of phenomenological understanding of, it gets deep into what it feels like to go blind, to lose your sight. Uh, and it's very touching, very moving, but it's very illuminating in some fascinating ways. And the first thing he notices is that when he begins to lose his sight, and ultimately when he loses his sight, he has to take a movement from a recognition of the world as being out there to the fact that the world is now in here. So when initially he lost his sight, he felt trapped insofar as he could no longer look out on the world. So all he could look at initially was uh, the confines of the way that his body was. But as he began to adjust, he began to move out in that sense and begin to recognize the world in different ways. And so his hands became uh, objects of sensory perception rather than just instrumental things for picking things up and putting things down. Now his hands were the way that he felt and touched 
the world and came to know the way the world was. Sounds were different. They had to be explained to him. They would come and go, and there was no sense of resonance. You know, when you hear a sound, you visualize it in ways that you really don't notice. He said that sounds were different. Colors had to be explained to him. The whole of the way that the world was was quite, quite different. Not different worse, but just quite, quite different. And it wasn't until he began to realize that he needed to recognize that he'd moved from the world of the sighted into the world of the blind, that he was able to adjust and understand that there is more than one way in which you can encounter the world through your bodies. Now, one of the things uh, he points out that's very important is that sighted people think that that's the only way that you can encounter the world. Those of us who have sight are always looking out at the world, seeing things, perceiving things with our eyes. Of course, if you perceive things with your eyes, you forget about your body. You forget about the way your body is interacting with the world. And you forget about the fact that there are a multitude of different ways in which we can encounter the world. And he says that uh, the problem with sighted people is that they don't realize that that's just one perspective on the way that you can look at the world. Uh, and the problem with sighted people, he suggests, is that there's a temptation to colonize the world. In other words, to assume that the only way that you can look at the world, look out at the world, be, uh, understand the world, is through your eyes. And so everybody has to be rehabilitated and adjusted into some kind of uh, vague approximation of what sighted people think they sh uh, looking at the world should be. And he says no. He says different bodies encounter the world in different ways. If I can't see, he says, I can encounter the world in ways in which sighted people can't even imagine the world to be. And his point is this, that no single thing, no single body that represents uh, humanness. Indeed, he would even go so far as to say there's no one way of being human. human. Being human is a range of possibilities that's profoundly shaped by the texture, the size, the way our bodies function in the world. And so the way that Adam encounters the world is very different from the way that you or I might encounter the world, but not different bad, but just different. Now the question is, how can we understand that? How can we really come to grasp, grasp with the breadth of what it means to be human being? Because it's only when we hear these different voices, and there's a whole cacophony of bodies in the world that tell us that the world is this, this way. It's only when we bring these things together in hospitable friendships that we can begin to understand, A, what it means to be a human being, and B, what it means truly to be the body of Christ in all of its diversity. And so John Howe opens up the possibility of understanding things different. So he says, all of us encounter the world through our bodies. The body is a source of knowledge. It's, it's not simply our minds that come to know God, it's our bodies that come to know God. And it's our bodies that come to recognize who God is. And you can see that very clearly, for example, in uh, dementia care. If you spent time with somebody who has uh, dementia, who has forgotten certain things, you very quickly come to realize the power and significance of their bodies. One of the things that we uh, assume, and one of the things that's so frightening about dementia is the idea that we um, forget things. Ultimately, we forget our friends, our families, and ultimately, we forget God and ourselves. And that's terrifying if we think that um, the way in which we become who we are is just by knowing things about ourselves. But there's, it's fascinating. I mean, that kind of understanding is based on a misperception of what memory is. Now, at one level, memory, memory is recall, right? So if you remember something, you bring something from the past, you bring it into the present, and you, you kind of uh, work towards the future on the basis of what you think you know and what you think you understand. Um, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a second dimension to memory that we oftentimes forget about. And that's the fact that our bodies remember things. Our bodies embrace things and remember things. You know, if you spend some time with uh, people who have 
dementia, it's fascinating to see the change that occurs in the context of worship, for example. You know, when I worked as a chaplain, you would go along to <clears throat> what were then dementia wards, and that's the most unfortunate way of putting it. But there'd be people there who would be uh, really hazy, really uncommunicative for most of the week. And that's primarily because they didn't get any stimulation. They used to sit al along the middle of a ward and watch television all day, watch kids' programs. But for whatever reason, they didn't communicate. But then you go in, and you take the sacraments in, and you start to say a prayer, and you start to engage in the sacraments, or you start to sing a hymn, and suddenly people move. Their bodies move in different ways. Their lips move, they sing songs, they dance, they participate in the sacrament. Now, if you're a psychologist, you may say, well, that's just well-ingrained memory, but that would be a mistake. Because what you see there is the habits, the practices, the Christian spirituality that people have worked out over many, many years manifesting itself in people's bodies. In other words, when you see somebody singing or when you see somebody praying or engaging in the sacraments, you see memory acted out in the now. It's not recall memory, it's memory that you can look at, see, touch and feel as people's bodies function in that way. And when people sing, for example, um, the part of your brain that processes, well, memory is processed all over the place, but one of the major processing uh, dimensions of the brain is quite close to the place where music is processed. And so one of the things about dementia is that it's not always that memories have been forgotten, i.e. lost. It's sometimes that just the neurological connections between uh, the memory and the ability to recall that memory have been fragmented, and there's no way that you can access that at a cognitive level. But what music can do, because these two processing centers are quite close, music can access memories that are inaccessible by any other way. And of course, when you hear music, you don't just hear music and sing along, you remember a place, you remember a time, you remember a relationship, you remember emotions. And so as you watch people uh, engage in this, the memories of their body, and as you hear them sing, they're taken to a place, and it's a place that's inaccessible in any other way. So what hymns do is not just make people happy, they actually take them to a place and take them to a space that's inaccessible otherwise. So bodies matter in that sense. And the diversity of human bodies matters. Think about it this way, in terms of the way that we encounter God. If you're blind, you'll never see the scriptures. If you're deaf, you'll never hear the word. If you have no arms, you'll never feel what it's like to embrace someone even though you are embraced. To be embraced by the love of God will have a totally different meaning if you don't have any arms. Not a better meaning or a worse meaning, just a different meaning. But likewise, if you can see, you'll never know what it's like to encounter God without sight. If you can hear, you'll never know what it's like to sign the word and to use your body in ways which a hearing person simply cannot grasp. If you can remember everything well, you'll never know what it's like to encounter God without remembering God. So you may think that you have all your faculties, but actually all your faculties may be the very thing that prevents you from seeing certain dimensions of who God is. In Aberdeen, we uh, used to have a distance learning pastoral care course, and it was a bit of a shamble sometimes, because what you had was like, people in a room and then you had people on a screen, and then you had people on the telephone, and then you had the poor person who had to coordinate all that stuff and hold them in uh, 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 semi-intellectual conversations. But I remember one, one uh, 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 class that we had, and in the class were a variety of people, but one woman who was, had no sight whatsoever, and so she had her, uh, her, her dog with her, uh, another woman who uh, had no hearing, and she had a hearing dog with her, and an interpreter. And at one point, we started to talk about spiritual experiences. 
And uh, we all went round the room and, and talk, talked about this. But then she said, the woman who was deaf said, uh, well, she began to tell us about this dream that she'd had of what heaven was going to be like. Uh, and she talked about uh, how she met Jesus and how Jesus was everything that she thought that he would be. And then she said, and his signing was amazing. Yeah. Now, her vision of heaven wasn't that she should suddenly hear things, but that the barriers that stopped other people communicating in the way that she did uh, were broken down. And she was able to communicate with Jesus in the way she'd always communicated with Jesus. And that's important, very important. So what I want to suggest to you is that we need to rethink our understanding of our relationship with those people whom we decide to call dis disabled. This is a, a painting of uh, uh, Pope Francis, when Pope Francis was a cardinal. And what you have in this picture is one of the most powerful religious uh, leaders in the world prostrating himself before one of the poorest and weakest members of a community, a young man who's dying of AIDS. Now, his position there is hugely different than his position would be if he towered over that boy, if he laid his hands on him from above. But instead, he gets down and he kisses the feet of this young man who is dying. In other words, he adopts a position within which he is not the host, but actually a guest in the life of this young man. And one of the startling things about the ministry of Jesus is that his hospitality and the way that he moved from being a guest to a host. Sometimes he was a guest in people's house, sometimes he was hosting people. And it's that beautiful movement between guest and host that gives us a sense of what divine hospitality looks like. Now, think about what John Hill says about the diversity of ways in which we're being human. And think about the way that God lives within our bodies. And think about what that means in terms of our hospitality. What would it be like if we were a guest in the life of somebody with advanced dementia? That we weren't there to try and transform them. We weren't there trying to try and rehabilitate them. We wanted to know and understand what it's like to be you. What would it be like to be a guest in Adam's life, not to try and to, to rehabilitate him, not to try and change him, but to try and understand what it means to know God when you're Adam. What would it be like if we could develop disability ministries within which we are hosted by people with disabilities, rather than trying to find spaces where we can bring them in in that sense? If we can get that rhythm of guesting and hosting, then things begin to look different. I'll give you a, a final example of what that might look like, to learn together who God is through our bodies in the midst of uh, what we call disability. Uh, a few years ago, we uh, did a, a research project looking at, the, um, how to, well, looking at the spiritual needs of people with profound and intellectual disabilities, people that don't have words for the, as the, the major form of language. And we spent time with families and individuals, beginning to try to get as deep as we could into what that feels like, what that experience is like, and ultimately how uh, religious communities can begin to um, accept and understand that dimension of being human. Uh, and we spent some time with uh, a young lady. Uh, her name was Margaret. Um, well, her name wasn't Margaret, but I'll call her Margaret. Uh, and she had a profound intellectual disability. She had no words. She was uh, blind, and she also had significant cerebral palsy. And she, um, she was good fun. She was a Quaker, and she belonged to the Quaker community. And the Quaker community, because of the way that they worked their, their theology, had accepted her early on, and she was just simply part of that community. And we spent quite a lot of time with the, the Quaker community, beginning to try to understand what goes on with her. Two stories from Margaret's st uh, story that I think you'll find interesting. The first story, in the midst of all of the difficulties that she was encountering in life, she had uh, quite recently, uh, at least when we were uh, involved with her, uh, received a diagnosis of leukemia. And so she'd been in hospital and she'd had various tests. 
uh, and they discovered that this was leukemia. Uh, and she was lying in her hospital bed, and her mother came in and said to her, Margaret, you've got leukemia. Now, I would be very surprised, but I don't know, if Margaret had any idea what leukemia meant. But immediately, she burst into tears, and immediately, she became anxious. Second story. At the heart of the Quaker worship is silence. They, they have this beautiful meditative space that they create as part of their worship, wherein they just do nothing. It's just quiet. It's just silent. And it's a very profound statement in many different ways. Um, when we talked to the members of the, the Quaker community, they, they said to us, you know, you should watch Margaret in the midst of our worship. Uh, and we thought, well, why don't we do that? And so the community gathered round, and they began to go into this contemplative meditative state. Um, Margaret was in the middle, lying on a map, and she was really very vocal, very noisy, clearly anxious about something. I don't know what it would have been like. But as the community went into its deep silence, we watched Margaret, and she went into that silence with them. As they began to dwell in the silence, so she seemed to be drawn into that silence. And very soon, she was part of that community. In that silence, in that meditative moment, they were all very much together. So what are we to make of these two stories? Well, the first one, as I say, I don't think that uh, Margaret would understand what uh, leukemia meant. But her mother did, and her mother was afraid, and her mother was anxious, and her mother transmitted that. Because anxiety, uh, like sadness, transmits between people. And if you spend time counseling somebody that, uh, who has anxiety, you can be guaranteed you'll leave there and you'll be really anxious. So emotions and feelings transmit in that sense. And she knew something was wrong because her mother knew something was wrong. In the context of the Quaker worship, something very, very similar happened. Uh, she didn't have the cognitive ability, or didn't seem to have, I, I, I wouldn't know, uh, to understand what was going on. But she understood the feelings, the emotions, the safety of that community. And when she felt that, she began to dwell in that. And when she dwelt in that, she became part of that. And the thing that we learned from that experience is that spirituality is not something that you do yourself. It's something that we do together. One of the interesting things about contemporary spirituality is it's, it's very often a mode of self-actualization. I want to find meaning, I want to find purpose, I want to find value, hope, and so on and so forth. But what Margaret teaches us is that spirituality is something that we do within the body of Christ, something that we do together, and it's something that we're dependent on one another to do. And so she offers a really profound challenge to hypercognitive theology or hypercognitive understandings of community, because it's only as we are together that we're able to understand who we are. And Stephanie also spoke very well about the significance of time. Now, both in the context of dementia and the context of the lives of people like Margaret, the only way that we can come to understand is by changing our perception of time, by beginning to slow down and noticing things. There's a really interesting uh, uh, theologian called, a Japanese theologian called Kosuke Koyama, who wrote many years ago a book called The Three Mile God. And the, the basic thesis of one of the essays in the book is that uh, the average speed that human beings walk at is three miles an hour. Jesus walked at three miles an hour. And Koyama says this, he says, love has its speed, he says it's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we're accustomed. It goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice it or not, at three miles an hour. It's the speed we walk, and therefore the speed that love of God walks. Something beautiful about that. Because the way that we use time in contemporary Western capitalist society, we use it like a money. We waste it and spend it and buy it and all of these things. What Kiyama is pointing us towards is that Jesus walks slowly. If you're walking at six miles an hour, 
and Jesus is walking at three miles an hour, then who are you following? Because it's only when we slow down and walk at three miles an hour that we realize the true nature of the body of Christ. And so finally, what I'm suggesting to you is if we take the time, if we slow down, and if we begin to recognize that diversity doesn't necessarily mean pathology and that humanness is not one thing but a multitude of different things that need to come together, then we can ask that question, what does it mean to encounter Jesus through Adam's body? What do we learn from Adam and his way of encountering the world that can help all of us as the body of Christ to be together as the body of Christ and to be enhanced, not only in our knowledge and our understanding, but in our bodily interactions and our perceptions of the way not only the world is, but the way that God is in the world and in us in that sense. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.